Hi, I'm Dave, and I'm the lead pastor here at New Life. And I just want to welcome you to our service. For me, there's no better place to be. And if you'd like to know more information about how to connect and different things that are going on, make sure you check down below and hit that like button, hit that subscribe button so you can see new services as they come online. So now, rather than sitting around, let's join in. No hide or death we see. No hide or death can separate. Your steadfast love who can escape. Your faithfulness and endless And mercy, we sing. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so again and inside you'll find a note-taking sheet. If you have a pen or pencil, you can follow along with this. And last week I challenged you to bring your Bible. And that can be your digital Bible if you've got a phone or an iPad or something like that, uh, or if you brought a physical Bible. But uh, every week, please, please, please bring your Bible because there's something about seeing with your own eyes. I know we put it up here on the screen and I think that's wonderful. I know we have it printed in here. That's great, it doesn't take away from it. But having it in your own Bible where you can circle or highlight or make notes in there is is a gift that, uh, man, you don't want to dismiss. So I want you to get your Bibles out right now, and I want you to turn to the book of John, chapter 15. And we're going to get to that verse and that passage in just a few minutes. Uh, As we continue on in this series called Jesus Changes 
everything. So I'm gonna make a bet. And don't come up to me afterwards and ask for any money or anything like that, because that's, that's not what it's for. But I'm gonna bet that if I went into your house and went into your kitchen, into your silverware drawer, that there is a knife in there and the tip is bent because you used it as a screwdriver. <laughs> I'm telling you, or there's a fork where, you know, it's just that one that's off a little bit because you tried to use it for something that it was not meant to be used for, right? We use all kinds of things like that. And most because I think we're impatient, right? We just, we don't want to run back to the garage for the 14th time, you know? So we use that knife for a chisel or a screwdriver and it never quite works just right. Sometimes we get by but it's not what it was made for. It's not the purpose behind it. I remember growing up <clears throat> one time, going into the kitchen or wherever it was and I got a scissors. And so I was doing some project for school. And I remember my mom coming and saying, that's not a paper scissors. That's for when I'm sewing, it's for material. And so she had scissors that she only used when she was doing sewing and then scissors we had for office. Now, all these years later, I gotta, years later, I gotta tell you, I don't know the difference between those things. To me, they're still just scissors. But for her, it was like, no, one does this and one does this. All comes down to purpose, what it was designed for, what it was made for. And we're gonna dive in today to what this looks like in our own lives as we think about what we were made for and what is our purpose and what, what use are, are we for, for God and for his kingdom. And it can be a really challenging thing as we start kind of wrestling with those. And, and, I, and, and even if you're a follower of Christ, I know many of us in here are, there come moments when we, we maybe are even thinking, is this, is this it? It's like, is this, is this the whole story? Is this, is this all, all there is? I know for me at, at times, and you know, it comes at weird moments, right? Like, like in the middle of the night when you can't sleep and your mind starts kind of spinning around. And I don't know why we do this. We go to problems and then we reevaluate our entire life at 3.30 in the morning, right? Like, is this all there is? But we, we have those, those times. Some people call that a wall. And we hit that and we start questioning. We start wondering. It's like, yeah, I, I believe in God and I have, I have faith, but ah, what? Is this what I'm here for, right? We, we wrestle with all of those things. And then what we do is we we kind of merge that or, or end up being uh, influenced by what happens in our culture. And our culture tells us that what we're a part of and who we associate with, that whatever brings us status in that way has this way of dictating, well, this is what you're all about. So then our jobs and our education and our social circle, the status that maybe we have, this is where meaning and purpose comes from. That's what culture tells us that you are what you do and you are what you've become and you are what people think about you. And yet, I'm sure for most of us in this room who've gone down that road at least some distance, it leaves us really hollow. And we start again back at that, is, is this it? Is this what I'm here for? What, what, what am I really here for? What, what does God wanna do in me? And as I said earlier, even as followers of Christ, we sometimes can get enamored by all those things, status and education and careers and material things and what we have and we get pulled off course. Because even though we believe Jesus is true, we've somehow compromised all that to pursue different purposes in life. C.S. Lewis, the famous author and theologian, he, he said this, he said, the only thing Christianity cannot be is moderately important. I love that statement. He's saying, listen, listen, you, you can't play middle of the road on this. If Jesus and following him is true, then it deserves everything we've got. All in, all or nothing. It's true and it should determine and direct the entire rest of our lives. It gives us purpose and meaning and all of those things. But if it's not, now we might as well just chuck it and go do whatever you want, right? Like there's, he's saying there's just no middle ground in this, so which way are you going to go? But I'll tell you, the Bible over and over and over again shows us that he is truth and righteousness, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And he offers us hope and purpose and meaning in this. 
Because Jesus changes everything about our outlook, our purpose, and what we pursue. He actually offers us what we've always been looking for. In fact, in John 10.10, 10, here's what Jesus says, really kind of around this whole idea of what are we here for and when, what is this all about? It says, he says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And then Jesus says, I've come that you may have life and have it to the full. Jesus offers us what we've been looking for, true life, and he offers it to the full. And he says, the thief only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's his, that's his baseline. That's all that Satan wants to do in us. But he's come to give us something more. So today, before we dive into this, I know we've prayed several times. I don't think we can pray too much, but I want you to bow your heads because I want to just dedicate these next moments to the Lord. So would you pray with me? Jesus, thank you for, for being life and truth to us. You're our hope and you're our salvation. And Lord, I pray in these next moments as we begin to unpack our purpose and what you've called us to and for and all that, Lord, I, I pray that you would speak deeply to us. I pray that, Lord, that you would touch somewhere deep within our own soul, that we would respond to you and be all in. Not, not stuck in neutral, not not compromising, not, not being pulled aside by what our world and culture wants, but instead asking that, what is it that you want? What is it that you want? And Lord, that we would lean into that with you. So Lord, today I pray that everything that is from me, from Dave, would just pass away. It wouldn't even make a, a dent in our memory or our thoughts, but Lord, everything that is from you, that you would teach us today and it would stick in our hearts and in our souls. We thank you, Lord, and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. So when we started this series, Jesus Change, Changes Everything, we, we began to look at how when, when we enter into this relationship with him, that it, it shifts the very foundation of our lives. And Jesus truly is the, the architect and the agent of, of change and transformation in us. And when he invites us to follow him, that's when this all really begins. And we move from old to new and from death to life and from darkness to light. And we can't earn our way into that. We can't educate ourselves into that. We can't be strong enough or talented enough. Those things, while fine, don't get us to this place because we realize it's all from him. There's no way we can somehow be the catalyst for this kind of change, that it's all about him. And the world and culture and our past and our friends and our family have all been in the process, whether they know it or not, of shaping and forming us. And they've shaped and formed us in really, really good ways. And there have been other ways that have been not so good, that have been unhealthy and dysfunctional. But Jesus offers us life to the full that actually begins to reform us and to reshape us more and more into his image. And my hope and prayer is that you would come to this place to know and truly believe that Jesus chose you and says, come, follow me. Come, know me. Come, let me instill my, my purpose and my, my challenge and, and all that I have for you. Let me instill that in you so that when you think it's like, why am I here? You know you know why you're here. You know what God, what God is about in you. So that's my, my hope and prayer today. And that you would begin to understand his plan and purpose for every single day of your life. So I'm gonna give you three things and, and these may seem basic, but these are the foundation pieces that, that we need to take hold of. The first is this, I am chosen. Write it down. I am chosen. Have any of you watched the... The Chosen, the, the TV show or the series that's on. If you haven't seen this, I would encourage you to go. I think it's on Netflix. You can find it on YouTube. Um, I think they're in like the fourth season or something now. But it really is the account of Jesus' life. And what I love about it is I think personally, it's the best portrayal of Jesus that there's been in media because he's real. Like, you know, like when you think of some of the older movies of Jesus, Jesus was always like, so serious, you know, it's just like, he's just teaching. He wasn't mad, you know, except when he drove out the temple 
merchants and all that. But, you know, it wasn't mad, but it was just this seriousness and this somberness. And I'm sure there were moments when Jesus was very serious and very somber. We read that in some of his teaching. But he was also fully human. And so in The Chosen, I think we see Jesus with a sense of humor and with laughter and with joking. There's just something that's relatable to him. And so that's why I just, I love that series. But here's the thing. Maybe you've never even thought about that. Why is it called The Chosen? Why isn't it called Jesus? Why isn't it called Jesus, his story? Or, you know, I mean, something like, oh, wait, Why? It's because it's not just about Jesus, but it's about those who are around him, those disciples, those followers, Peter and James and John and Matthew, and you see their stories begin to unfold. And the reason they they decided on that is because these were the ones that Jesus said, I want you to follow me. But here's what's crazy. It's the same invitation that he gives today. If you're there in John 15, I want you to look at verse uh, 16. And here's what it says. This is Jesus talking now. He says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. Now, I know he was talking to his his group there because this was right before Jesus was betrayed, right before the trial began on the way to the cross. This is all at the beginning of that. But understand anytime he's talking to his followers, He's talking to us and he's saying, listen, I know you had a choice in this, right? We, even the disciples, it's like, are they gonna follow or not? But he's saying that at at the forefront of all this is before you did anything, I wanted you. I wanted you. And he didn't call us and he didn't choose us so that we can sit on the sidelines of faith so that we can just be church attenders. Which again, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you think that attending church is all that there is, man, that's just, that's just the beginning. God has so much more. And he chose you and he called you because he has purpose and meaning and usefulness in your life. He actually wants you to bear fruit. And what in the world does that mean? Like we know it doesn't mean anything literal or agricultural. But what Jesus is talking about here is the outcome of our spiritual life that results from living according to his teaching and according to this connection and relationship we have with him, much like branches into a vine. Much like branches into a vine. And this is where John 15, five, so if you're there in John 15, just scroll up a little bit to verse five. Here's what Jesus tells his followers. He said, I am the vine and you are the branches. And if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Now listen to this. He says, but apart from me, you can do nothing, nothing. So again, there's two sides to this and I wanna be clear. He talks again about fruit, that you're going to bear much fruit. So we come back and go, what is this fruit that we're talking about? Well, the apostle Paul, answers that for us in Galatians 5. He says, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit. So here we go. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And he says, there's no law against these things. So this is the fruit, these these God-ordained, these God-driven characteristics that are produced in our life, but not because we study enough or because we work hard or we strain hard or we prove ourselves, but in other words, the Holy Spirit in Christ is at work in us, producing and reforming us more and more into the image of Christ. Now go back to what uh, Jesus said in John 15. He said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, here's what's challenging about that. I think sometimes we read that and think, so I can't do anything. So Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. So am I nothing? Am I just, like we think Jesus is maybe speaking about our worth or our value. And if you keep reading in John 15, what you'll find is that Jesus is telling his followers, he's telling us that we are deeply loved by him. And he even promises to send his spirit to guide us and direct us. He affirms 
and strengthens our worth and our, and our value completely in this. But he's reminding us that fruit doesn't come from a branch on its own, but only as it's connected to the vine. Now, I know the context of this chapter and of this, this moment in Jesus' ministry. Again, he's about to be betrayed. He's about to be arrested and all those things going on. And in these chapters in, towards the end of John, you see Jesus kind of summing everything up. It's like if you knew that you were going away, if you knew that life was coming to a close or you'd never see people again, you'd want to say, hey, I, I just want to remind you. I just want to remind you. Like, wow, th- these are the things that matter. These are the things that are important. And so he wants to say them again and again to them. Yesterday, our, our grandson was, was over at our house and um, I always do this thing with him. I'll go, hey, you know what? And sometimes he'll go, what? And I'll go, I love you, you know? And sometimes I'll go, hey, you know what? And he'll go, you love me. Like, you know, he, he knows it. And Gina and I were both doing it to him. Hey, love you more, love you more. And at one point we go, you know what? And he goes, uh, we said, we love you. And he goes, do we have to go over this again? You know? <laughs> Because it's like, okay, you've said it again and again and again. But Jesus is wanting to say in these final moments, this stuff really matters and I don't want you to miss it. So I understand the context of it. But I wonder, this is just me, I wonder if, if there was a moment earlier at some point, could have been months, could have been a couple of years earlier, if Jesus and his disciples weren't walking through a vineyard and there were maybe the cuttings uh, from the pruning And I wonder if Jesus, who was the master of in the moment teaching, picked up one of those branches and went, guys, this can't bear fruit unless it's connected to the vine. On its own, can't do anything. Can't do anything. It's separate. But connected to the vine, it's going to bear much fruit. And you see, for us to step into and sustain God's purpose for us in life, we have to remain in Jesus, the true vine, and to walk with him daily by listening and learning to him through through God's word and through prayer and worship and silence and serving and connecting with other followers of Jesus. This is how we remain in that. But know this, at the very beginning that Jesus chose you and he invites you to live in that relationship, to live remaining in him so that we can bear fruit. Bear fruit that will draw us close to him and bear fruit that will benefit others. That's what he does. Write this down for number two. My purpose is to be useful to Jesus. My purpose is to be useful to Jesus. Now you're gonna do something on your sheet here, so I want you to keep it out, have your pen or pencil ready because we finish this whole thing and we have, to send, uh, we have to send our notes to our graphics team who put your program together. We send it to our tech team who put things up here and it's great. But sometimes after we've done all that, we go, you know what, I think I wanna change that. And I was looking at this, it's like my purpose is to be useful to Jesus. And you know what, that's true. I wanna be available and useful to Jesus. But there's one word in there I want us to change. It's, it's that last two. And here's what I want you to change it to. Because we're not just useful to Jesus, but my purpose is to be useful with Jesus. So would you just put a line through that last two and write with over the top? And that may seem like a, like a little minor thing to you, but can I tell you it's not. In fact, I think it's critical for us because our our life in Christ is not based on our own strength or our own wisdom, our own ability. It's not just, and I gotta do more and more and more that we get into this production mentality that it's like, well, I need to do more and more. And it's like, God may call you to that, but he's not calling you to do that on your own, but to do it with Jesus. And we know this because in Matthew chapter 11, that easy yoke passage, what does Jesus say? That, that we learn and, and we walk in these rhythms with him and, and we do the work with him in this because on our own, what can we do? Nothing, but with him, all things are possible. 
So this is a critical thing for us. We get to partner with Jesus and we were created and designed to be his hands and feet. We were not created to be useless, but to be useful with him. Here's what it says in 2 Timothy. If you keep yourself pure, you will be a special utensil for honorable use. Your life will be clean and you will be ready for the master to use you for every good work. Don't you love that? Jesus didn't just invite us to join him so that, and I've said this several times, but so that we could sit on the sidelines or just be church attenders. Again, attending church is great. I encourage it. It's where we come together and worship all those things, but there's so much more. And when Jesus chose and called his disciples, there was purpose and there was reason. Jesus saw in them something. He says, come and follow me. And they didn't know it then, but he said these, these simple words. He said, I will teach you how to be fishers of men rather than fishers of fish, I guess would be the phrase, right? Because that's all they were. They were, they were fishermen. But he says, I've got something more for you. There's purpose and meaning in this. He sees, he sees use in us, purpose, direction for his kingdom. You know, all of us in some way or another, we carry with us the tools that we feel are necessary day to day. Now that's becoming less and less. Uh, you know, we don't carry around, you know, axes and things like, you know, maybe a century ago that you had to provide your own firewood and, you know, go out and hunt your own food and do all that. But, but we carry certain things. So uh, all of us in this room, I'm assuming, have like a wallet. And in this wallet are the tools you need to navigate and get through at least a certain portion of life, right? You may have a little money in there. You may have an insurance card. You may have an ID and license, all these different things. These are some tools that you need. Some of you carry other kinds of tools. So uh, how many of you guys in here carry like a pocket knife with you? Yeah, some of you do. Please don't get it out. But right now, uh, you carry that. And maybe uh, you probably use it like to open a package from Amazon or whatever like that. That's great. And uh, for some of you women in here, you carry a purse. And in there are the things that you need, tools that you need to get through the day for emergencies. You may have different things in there besides your wallet. You may have a pack of tissues. You may have keys. You may have the different things. See, we all carry all these different things. I have a backpack that has stuff in there that I need, right? From, from day to day, and, and I will do that. But when I think about this, we carry these tools to help us get through and, and kind of finish whatever project or whatever life sends our way, right? We don't carry everything, but we carry the most important things. That's my aim with Jesus. I wanna work with him to accomplish what is needed and necessary. I wanna be useful for him that he can use to build his kingdom and to touch lives. So some of you may be like, to use our example, some of you may be a pocket knife. Some of you may be a pack of tissues. Maybe you're a multi-tool. Maybe, you know, we're all different. It, it doesn't matter, but the truth is this, you are each created individually and uniquely and purposefully for his will and his desire. I had a guy who, he comes here, he was in our first service this morning. He came up to me and he goes, thank you for that. He goes, I keep thinking that I'm like a scalpel in the hands of God, but I realized I'm a chainsaw. And it's like, hey, we need chainsaws, right? If you're taking down a tree and all you have is a scalpel, that is gonna be a long process, right? So we're all uniquely wired. And the Bible even says that we were created for his pleasure so that we as his creation would have the pleasure of knowing him back. He, he made us, he knows us, and he loves us so that we could know him and love him back. Here's what it says in Revelation 4. It says, you are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and they exist because you created what you pleased. Some versions say uh, everything was created for your pleasure. Now, understand pleasure doesn't mean amusement. God didn't create all of this and go, I'm so amused by this human tragedy that's going on. I'm so amused by this human history that's unfolding. It's not, it's not this kind of low level amusement by God. It really is this, that God finds joy in you. 
God finds joy in you. Scripture tells us that, that God rejoices over us. And we rarely think of that, but that, that word rejoices in Scripture has everything to do with like singing and dancing. It's a celebration. And the Bible says God does that over you. And yet I wonder when you think about God, if you were to picture, if you were to picture God's face, would he be smiling at you? Or would he be somber and serious? I think there's times for somber and serious. The problem is we never go to, to rejoicing over us. We never think or rarely think of God smiling over us. Because I know we, we go, well, I know I'm not perfect. I know I'm not kind of doing things right. We, know we can come up with all the reasons. But do you, do you know that our heavenly father smiles over you? He loves that, that you exist. In fact, you don't remember your birth, but when you were born, God was in that room smiling ear to ear because he wanted you made. He wanted you here. And so he created you to enjoy you. He made you for his purpose and plan. You see, God's a creative being and it gives him great pleasure to create. He's also a personal being and it gives him great joy to create you and me so that he can have a genuine personal relationship with us. And he desires that of every single person to be, to be his representatives, to, to go out into the world that people could experience God's goodness and grace through us. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew, he said, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you and be sure of this, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. He says, I've done this in you, now go. Go. And you can, you can spread this good news. You can be part of that. See, we've been We've been chosen and called to go into the world and to share how this personal relationship with Jesus has blessed and changed and transformed our life. It's, it's, and that's why our stories matter so much. What God has done in us matters. You've got a story, I've got a story. I know some of our stories are, are more dramatic than others, but all the stories are powerful in the same way because it reaches different people in different circumstances in different ways. That's why I love it when Celebrate Recovery has their weekend and we get to hear their stories of God's rescue and God's power. I love every time we have baptisms and we get to hear, like, how did you come to know Jesus? And we get to hear these stories of God's work through family changes and life changes and dysfunction and sometimes personal struggles but how God redeemed and saved. And sometimes even just how people quietly experienced God's invitation to walk with him and to know him. All of those are so powerful. And that's why God says, listen, I'm, I'm doing this work in you. I've called you, I've called you. I wanna do this with you so that you can take a step closer to me and then you can love people closer to me. And I'm telling you that, Regardless of what your story, I look at my story and I'm not gonna do my whole story kind of thing. I, I always used to call my story vanilla. This is very vanilla. Like there's no inner city challenge, you know, I didn't come out of the mafia or anything like that, you know. It just was very vanilla. And you know, over the years, I've come to appreciate my vanilla story because it's full of God's blessing. It has not been perfect. There have been a whole lifetime of cascading events and decision points and failures and struggles, but also victories and joy that has led me right to this moment. And God's not finished doing his transforming and his reforming work in me. And he's doing the same in you. So wherever you find yourself today, let me tell you, it is part of a journey that leads you to Jesus one step closer. You have been chosen and God has a purpose, a plan and a use for you. I want you to write this down for number three. Can you do that today? It's this. I can live a life that is filled with his life. I can live a life that is filled with his life. Now that may sound a little bit confusing in that, but he calls us to live this life that is empowered and strengthened by him. Because you see, we're not only recipients of God's grace, but we're also his ambassadors. 
that we can go and share this good news to love people as our mission is here, one step closer to Jesus. And there's an old quote that I've never forgotten and you've probably heard it before, but it's this, preach the gospel at all times, the good news of Jesus, preach it at all times. And if necessary, use words. So what if we were so filled by the love and the grace and the truth of Jesus that it began to overflow and to spill out of our lives into our homes, our schools, our workplace, and our community? David wrote, taste and see that the Lord is good. So here's my question. How much tasting have you done lately? Have you been tasting of God's goodness and God's grace? Have you been tasting of his love? Because even though we would say, yes, I believe and I trust in Jesus, sometimes we're, we're giving and we're doing all the things we need to do, but, but we're not receiving ourselves. Have you ever watched Iron Chef on Food Network or you know, one of those kind of cooking shows? Have you ever noticed on their workstations, they have this whole container and it's filled with spoons. So they're cooking. This is what cooking looks like, by the way. <laughs> So they're cooking, doing whatever they're doing. And then they'll reach over and they'll grab a spoon. Yeah, and then they'll always put the spoon in the discard pile, right? Because you do not double dip. Do not double dip. Some of you are double dippers. You don't do that when you're a chef. But they take that spoon and, and they taste. Because they're not just making this to give, though they are preparing it for people. They get to taste as well and they get to receive and they get fulfilled from the goodness of this cooking before they, they, they give it away. How many of us are tasting what we wanna give away? Are we tasting of God's goodness? Are we tasting of his faithfulness? Are we tasting of his love and his mercy and his joy? What if, what if we were so filled up with Jesus, as I said, that it just began to spill over and the people in our lives would begin to experience Jesus even through us. Because his love, his love is so real and true and present. When we taste it, we get to share it. Here's what Jesus said. He said, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other and your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. The world will know who we are by the way that we love him and love one another. Man, this is a powerful thing to be a representative of Jesus, to show his love to those around us, to let it spill over into, into the people around us, into our community, into our families. What could God do in us individually and together as a church if we were so intent on leaning in close to Jesus, of growing deep in him and having that just thrive in us, that it would be unmistakable. Second Corinthians says, so we are Christ's ambassadors, his representatives, and God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Jesus, we speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. Our purpose in this life is to bring honor and glory to God in everything we do. That, that's number one. He loves us and he rejoices in us. And whether you're at work or at home or at school, whatever that looks like, whatever you're doing, wherever you're at, you're called, you're equipped, and you're chosen to take one step closer to him and then to love others one step closer. You were created for this. Would you bow your heads with me? Jesus, we thank you today for choosing us, for calling us, for picking us, saying, I want you. And Lord, that wasn't just to, as we've said so many times today, just ride the bench or jump through some hoops or be religious, but it's to enter into relationship and life with you. And Lord, to know that, that your life in us, it, it, it's changed everything. We have the story of, of hope and life change. We, we each have our journey that we've been on, and yet we see you as the architect of it all. And I pray, Lord, that we could live and we could thrive in you. And it would change our community. It would change our world. Not because of us, but because of you. We thank you, Lord. We pray this in your name. 
Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? We're going to finish our time today. I asked Shamina to come back up. And we're going to just do the, the verse and the chorus of the last song that we sang. Jesus set my heart on fire. And my hope and my prayer is that this would resonate down in you. This would become your cry to be moved, to find your purpose and your hope and your life in him. Shamina, would you lead us in this? our other services I think God's preparing us and we don't even know what it is yet but it's not going to be some big thing it's not going to be a ministry that you sign up for it's going to start right here a call to grow deeper in him a call to take one step closer to him and as that begins to take root, as it begins to flourish, as the fruit begins to grow in that, I'm telling you, it's, it's gonna impact everything around you. Relationships and workplace and school. When we fully surrender, when God sets our hearts on fire. But just imagine what that looks like when we as a church family are walking in that together. I don't know. I don't know what that's gonna look like, but I want it more than anything. So I'm praying for you. I'm praying for me that it would take root and that it would be deep and we would see, we would see God's work and God's hand and God's purpose fulfilled in us and among us. So I'm praying for you. And so this week, let that be your prayer. God, what does this look like for my heart to be set afire? What does this look like for me to be all in, to live out your purpose, your call, your, your calling and in, in, in choosing me? What does that look like? Let me live it out. Hey, thank you so much for coming and being part of our church family. Thank you for joining each week to, to worship and come together. I'll tell you, keep praying. God's, God's on the move. Hey, by the way, one last thing. If you're here and you just need someone to pray with you today, we're gonna have some of our prayer team down here in front. They'd love to take a moment and pray with you. So thanks for being here. Have a great week. Go in God's blessing. <laughs>